So ladies and gentlemen, would you kindly take your seats so that we can begin our opening ceremony? Good morning, Professor Dr. Her Royal Highness, Acting Director General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and a very, very warm welcome to this year's IAEA Scientific Forum, A Decade of Cancer Control and the Way Forward. I'm Melinda Crane. It will be my great honor to accompany you as moderator today and tomorrow. Excellencies, the topic of this year's forum was personally chosen by the late Director General. This was a topic of utmost priority for him. I think I can speak for all of us in saying how very much we miss him. May I kindly ask you to stand just for a moment to remember the late Director General, Yukiya Amano. Thank you. Now, just a few housekeeping hints before we begin our opening ceremony. We will have simultaneous interpretation during this ceremony for French, Spanish, and Russian. Here are the channels that you will need to use on your headsets. If you'd like to have translation into English, please use channel three. If you're looking for translation into French, please use channel four. Russian will be channel five, and Spanish will be channel six. As you know, our forum is part of the General Conference, so your badge that entitles you to come to the forum will also serve to admit you to other GC events. We will be streaming the forum live. If you see cameras in the room, that's what they're here for. Um, so uh, please just be aware of that. You can find our program and additional background on our topic on the Scientific Forum website and also on the IAEA Conferences and Meetings app. And we also will be posting some photos to that site. You can also find us on Twitter, and if you hear something noteworthy that you'd like to share, and I'm absolutely sure that you will, then please do tweet it out. Our general conference hashtag is hashtag IAEAGC. And this year, our annual reception, which is an event not to be missed, will take place here in this building on the second floor in room CO2. And now, let us turn to our subject. Cancer is now the second leading cause of death worldwide. And I think I don't need to remind you that that makes it a growing threat, not only to the health of individuals, but also to development and to societal well-being. Dealing with this scourge strains scarce resources, especially for low and middle income countries. No wonder that cancer is a focus of the sustainable development goal dedicated to health. Ever since it was founded, the IAEA has been working to sp support its member states in use of nuclear science and technology for better diagnosis, treatment, and management of cancer. Under the late Director General's leadership, this work took on very high priority. This year's forum will highlight the achievements of the past 10 years and also explore future opportunities and priorities for action. Throughout the forum, in two sessions, today and tomorrow, we'll hear insights from eminent scientists, from practitioners and policymakers working in nuclear science here at the IAEA and in member states all over the world. I'll tell you more about what's in store in just a moment, but let us begin first with a word from our host. It is my honor to hand over the floor now to Acting Director General of the IAEA, Mr. Cornel Ferruzza. Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. 
Professor Dr. Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to welcome you all to the 2019 IA Scientific Forum. We are honored that Professor Dr. Her Royal Highness Princess Chulaborn of Thailand is here today. The IEA has had very fruitful cooperation with Thailand in human health for many years. Ladies and gentlemen, when world leaders adopted the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, they made a commitment. In Sustainable Development Goal number three, on good health and well-being, the commitment was to reduce the number of deaths from non-communicable diseases such as cancer. Cancer killed nearly 10 million people last year. Let's pause for a second. 10 million people last year. What about the year before and the year before that? What about this year? It's a shocking figure. And the problem is that the number will continue to rise. And another reality that we have to deal with, cancer is no longer a disease of prosperous countries, as it was often perceived in the past. By 2030, some 60% of all new cancer cases, 60% of all new cancer cases, and that's in only 12 years, will be recorded in developing countries. And that is where 70% of cancer-related death will occur. We have to pause again, because that's the picture for the future. And what do we do about it? We know very well at the IEA that radiation medicine plays an essential role in the diagnosis, treatment, and man management of cancer. And over the last 10 years, under the leadership of our late Director General Yuki Amano, helping low and middle income countries to improve access to radiotherapy and nuclear medicine became a top priority for the IEA. And that will remain the case. The figures that I was talking about earlier provide no alternative. And many parts of our agency are involved, including the Division of Human Health, the Program of Action for Cancer Therapy, the Division of Physical and Chemical Sciences, and the Department of Nuclear Safety and Security. Cancer and human health generally are also priorities for our 171 member states. And I'll have to tell you that health accounts for around a quarter of spending under the IA Technical Cooperation Program. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Another shocking reality, half of all cancer deaths are among women. Millions of women in developing countries suffer and die from cancers that would often be treatable if they had access to modern, modern cancer care. One of the first events I attended this morning was an event on gender mainstreaming in our activities. Let's try to put that into perspective. On the one hand, we try to promote and empower women to play an important role in our societies at the international level. On the other hand, we have this reality when we know that half of the cancer death affect women. And breast and cervical cancer are the most common killers in low and middle income countries. In 2018, more than 2 million women, 2 million women, 
were diagnosed with breast cancer in such countries. And around 600,000 women died of the disease. I don't think we have words to describe such a tragedy. Now, this is the gloomy picture, and our responsibility is to try to connect the dots, to put together the resources we have at our disposal, and to address the matter. There are some good stories as well, where different institutions put together their resources. And I am pleased to announce the launch of a new initiative. We do it in partnership with the Islamic Development Bank. I'm very grateful for your presence, Mr. President, here. To fund IE projects tackling women's cancers in countries which are members of both the bank and the agency. I am grateful for the bank's support in this important effort, and I have to say that the Islamic Development Bank is one of our strongest partners in a number of IE activities. And also in the next two days, ladies and gentlemen, you'll hear about the progress made in many countries in improving access to modern cancer, uh, cancer care, and often with the assistance of the agency. We also have reasons to be proud of, to be satisfied of. Nuclear techniques have made a significant contribution to human well-being and saved tens of millions of lives. It is true, the problems remain huge. Many low-income countries are still ill-equipped to deal with a growing cancer burden. Dozens of countries do not have a single radiotherapy machine. And there are nearly 60 countries, 60 countries, where less than a quarter of patients have access to radiotherapy. In many cases, prevention, screening, early diagnosis and treatment services are non-existent or inadequate. Uh, yesterday, after a conversation I had with an ambassador of a member state, I had a bit of a bad conscience because he asked how we can overcome a cycle of failed expectations. And I had a bad conscience because, uh, because of my time constraints, I was not able to properly address that. But I think gatherings like this, platforms like this one, that facilitate putting together the best resources we have, and not only financial, it's also human and ideas and creativity and innovation in science and technology can continue to support the mission of the IEA. And I think the IEA helps countries to improve cancer care, both at the level of individual hospitals and at the policy level. We do send experts to assess the level of nuclear medicine and radiotherapy services in a country. And we offer recommendations on improvements. We also help countries to plan and build nuclear medicine and radiotherapy facilities. We arrange for the education and training of oncologists, radiologists, and medical physicists. And we advise countries on putting the necessary nuclear laws on the statute book and adhering to IE nuclear safety standards and security guidance. We offer dosimetry and quality management services to ensure patients receive just the right dose of radiation, which is key in cancer treatment. Today, the IEA and the World Health Organization are launching a new tool, which I presented yesterday in the opening of the general conference. It is a roadmap towards a national cancer control program. This is not just a publication. This is not just a piece of paper. I think it's a solid 
guide for member states in developing or enhancing national cancer control programs. It sets out milestones which country can follow in establishing nuclear medicine, diagnostic imaging, and radiotherapy services. And I think you'll know more about it during this meeting today and tomorrow. And I'm confident that this new roadmap will become an indispensable tool for member states. But what I have to reassure you of is that the IA will be there to accompany our member states in this effort of absorbing the guidance and the recommendations from, from the document. Over the next uh, two days, ladies and gentlemen, you'll also learn about some of the dramatic technological advances being made in the cancer field and about the work of the IA to make this available to as many patients as possible. Tomorrow you will hear how computer simulation helps surgeons to remove tumors, how artificial intelligence and apps make doctors work easier, and how radiopharmaceuticals help not just to detect cancers, but to target and treat them. Patients around the world benefit greatly from the collaborations between the agency and the WHO, as well as with professional organizations and NGOs, many of whom I'm pleased to see represented here today. I am confident that our discussions these two days will bring new insights on how to maximize our assistance to member states to make the most of nuclear technologies for human health. And I'm very grateful for the presence of high-level representatives here today. This reflects the importance which countries attach to cancer control and to the IA's work in this area. I think 10 years ago, we were not where we are now. And I think 10 years from now, or 20 years from now, we should be in a better place than we are today. And the figures that we'll be reflecting will be much, much, much lower. And I would like to thank the experts, both on the podium and in the audience, who have come to share their knowledge for the benefit of all member states. And ladies and gentlemen, the ultimate reason why all of us are here in this room today is because we want to save lives. And at the IA, we keep the needs of individual cancer patients uppermost in our minds. I think we will now see a film about what this means in practice, taking the very encouraging example of one country. I thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you success in the deliberations today and tomorrow. Thank you, Madam Moderator. When it started, uh, it start, started like a flow. But when the days goes on, I feel I can't uh, breathe. I, I decided to go to hospital. And when the doctor looked at me in my nose, he said, you have a tumor. In Tanzania, as in many developing countries, cancer patients have often struggled to get access to the treatment they need. In most high-income countries, there are about five radiotherapy machines for every million people. In Tanzania, until recently, there was just one machine for all 57 million people.
about 10 years ago, the situation was really different from the way it is now. The outcome was really, really uh, not good. People's lives were being slowly eaten away by a disease that is often curable in other parts of the world. For a young man like Rashid, being forced to spend a year in bed was almost too much to bear. I couldn't do anything. Mm. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't do my job. I was only sleeping yeah. all days. I've been. You know, one day, I can stand to go to all the food. Luckily for Rashid and many thousands of others like him, things had been changing in Tanzanian hospitals. After recognizing the growing cancer crisis in Tanzania, the IAEA chose the Ocean Road Cancer Institute to show what can be done if you mobilize the right resources for cancer care. To reach patients across the country, the IAEA has also been helping the government provide radiotherapy in the northern city of Mwanza. In the past, Doctors here had to send their cancer patients 1,200 kilometers away for treatment. 20 years ago, you write to her that she has to go to Dar es Salaam. She does not have any relatives. She does not know where Dar es Salaam is. They used to stay home and die. But now, the situation is different. We have been uh, supporting Tanzania since they started offering radiotherapy services. Today, Tanzania has got several uh, new machines that they're able to use to treat the patients in the country. Additionally, and most importantly also, we've been able to uh, help Tanzania train oncologists and technicians that are able to use these machines more effectively and efficiently in treating the patients. One of the first patients to benefit from the improved facilities in the north was Margaret, a preacher from across Lake Victoria. Margaret was diagnosed with cervical cancer two years ago and received weeks of radiotherapy at Bugando Medical Center before being declared cancer-free. <laughs> <laughs> the survival rates will increase because, one, we have patients now at early stage. Second, we have proper modalities for treatment. That will increase the survival rates. Back in Dar es Salaam, things are looking up for Rashid as well. We have been receiving machines, knowledge, funds from different uh, organizations like the IA, and also the government is still uh, supporting us quite a lot. Because of this, we, we have been able to give hope to our patients, yes. After receiving 30 sessions of radiotherapy on the new machine, Dr. Sio tells Rashid that his tumor is almost gone and that the doctors expect it to disappear entirely after some follow-up chemotherapy. I'm feeling, I'm feeling better. I'm feeling like uh, I'm going to reach my goals. Yes. Yes. Tanzania has made vast gains over the last decade. But with the constant flow of new cancer cases, more resources are always needed. It's not just Tanzania that faces this issue. Access to radiotherapy is still extremely limited in many low- and middle-income countries. The IAEA is working with partners around the world to improve this and boost cancer care in general by supporting research, arranging training, 
offering procurement support and providing guidance on international safety standards. All cancer patients deserve the same second chance as Rashid and Margaret. Ladies and gentlemen, that film will be available on the IAEA Scientific Forum website. So if you'd like to see it again, and certainly it was very inspiring, that's where you will find it. We focus there on one country, on a few patients, but as we heard at the end, that story is a story that's being repeated in many, many other places in the world, countries that are working to overcome obstacles to effective cancer control with IEA support. We will hear more such stories in the course of the forum. The Acting Director General talked about connecting up the dots. That's what we're going to be doing, for example, in our first session a little bit later on this morning when we look at member states' experience setting up all the milestones that together add up to effective cancer control. We heard about the IAE's support efforts. We're going to take a deeper dive on that in our second session later on this afternoon, particularly looking at what the IAE can, can do for countries as their needs evolve and as technologies change. Tomorrow morning, session three, a deeper dive on those new innovative technologies that we heard mentioned both in the film and by the acting director general. Very exciting advances there that offer much greater precision, both on diagnosis and on treatment and assessment of therapy. We'll talk about that tomorrow morning. And then we'll come back to the subject of partnerships because they are so crucial, not only in the area of cancer control, but pretty much everywhere where nuclear science and technology uh, are involved. And we'll be talking about partnerships like the one that we heard a little bit uh, about from the Acting Director General with the Islamic Development Bank. So that's what's in store, and finally we'll, we'll connect all those dots back up in our closing ceremony tomorrow as well. Let us now continue with our opening ceremony, and we will now hear from an array of leaders who are working very hard to spur action on cancer control in their countries or in their institutions. Our first speaker is an accomplished scientist who was awarded UNESCO's Einstein Medal for her long-running effort to advance scientific collaboration both in her own country and throughout Asia. In 1987, she founded the Chulabhorn Research Institute, which now houses nine laboratories, including the first comprehensive cancer center in Thailand. It is a very great honor to welcome here to the Scientific Forum Professor Dr. Her Royal Highness Princess Chulabhorn. Excellency, Her Royal Highness, the floor is yours. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, cancer is a major health burden in Thailand. In the past decade, new modalities of diagnosis and treatment have been introduced and implemented in Thailand through the establishment of more than 10 specialized government-run cancer centers with a capacity for radiation therapy in many remote provinces of Thailand. In 2009, a 100 bed Dulapon Cancer Center was established with my aspiration to provide the best and comprehensive cancer care to, for Thai people, regardless of their social and, or, and economic background. This hospital is about to celebrate its 10th year anniversary next month, has advanced 
facilities such as the first National Cyclotron and Pet Center and the most advanced imaging technology and radiotherapy in Thailand. Through technical collaboration with IEAE, we are able to produce new radio pharmaceutical agents that I use not for only diagnosis and treatment of cancer, but also for other medical illnesses. Moreover, a new project to establish the National Proton and Carbon Carbon Beam under my name is on the way to create an international facility, make use of the highest technology in radiation for therapy of cancer patients. With my vision to educate and produce medical personnel that are highly needed in Thailand, such as medical doctor, radiological technologist, medical physicist, a new higher institution, Jula Pond Royal Academy of CRA has been established in 2016. The first batch of students is expected to graduate from CRA in 20 in 2021. They will soon become an important workforce for the care of cancer patients in the country. Thailand has become one of the IAEA member states since 1957. IAEA assisted Thailand with clinical training of radiation oncologists, nuclear medicine specialists, radiologists, and medical physicists, and also assisted Thai hospital to conduct standardized quality assurance program. With this long-standing collaboration, I strongly believe that in the next decade to come, we will continue to improve the quality of life of cancer patients through development of specialized facilities with highly skilled personnel and discovery of innovative diagnostic and treatment technique for the highest benefit of the people, not just in Thailand, but from the people who come to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Her Royal Highness Princess Chulaporn, for being with us today. Our next speaker is deeply committed to advancing cancer control, both in her own country, Burkina Faso, and elsewhere in Africa. Last year, she hosted a gathering of 16 African First Ladies to boost prevention and treatment, and this year her country launched a new cancer treatment center with support from the Qatar Fund for Development. She will speak in French, so please uh, use channel three if you're looking for translation into English. A warm welcome now, please, for Her Excellency, Madame Sika Kabore, First Lady of Burkina Faso. Monsieur le Directeur Général par Interim, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, Honorables Invités, Je voudrais commencer 
par avoir une pensée particulière à l'endroit de M. Yukiya Amano, directeur général de l'Agence internationale de l'énergie atomique, qui nous a quittés récemment et dont la disparition reste encore vive dans nos mémoires et dans nos cœurs. Ce faisant, je tiens à exprimer ma sincère et profonde compassion à sa famille, à ses collaborateurs, ainsi qu'à toutes les personnes qui l'ont connu et qui restent affectées par ce départ douloureux. À toutes et à tous, je réitère mes sincères condoléances. La délégation que je conduis ici voudrait saluer les efforts inlassables que cet illustre disparu a fourni tout au long de sa longue et riche carrière au service de la paix et de la sécurité dans le monde. Sous sa direction, notre organisation commune a pu réaliser des progrès tangibles et nous lui savons gré de ses immenses efforts accomplis. L'atome au service de la paix et du développement reste pour nous un objectif réalisable au profit de nos populations laborieuses. Monsieur le directeur général par intérim, mesdames et messieurs, de nos jours, le cancer est devenu un grave problème de santé publique qui concerne tout le monde, car les souffrances occasionnées lors de son développement n'épargnent personne dans aucune communauté humaine. Cette maladie constitue la deuxième cause de mortalité dans le monde selon les données de l'Organisation mondiale de la santé. En 2018, il a été enregistré environ 18,1 millions de nouveaux cas et 9,6 millions de décès. Malheureusement, environ 70% de ces décès surviennent dans les pays à faible revenu ou à revenu intermédiaire, parmi lesquels figure mon pays, le Burkina Faso. En effet, dans mon pays, depuis 2012, ce sont environ 7 800 nouveaux cas de cancer qui sont diagnostiqués annuellement. Plus de 6 200 familles sont endeuillées chaque année, soit près de 25 décès par jour. Je vous laisse faire le calcul pour la suite. Pour l'année 2018, selon Globocan, 11 643 nouveaux cas de cancer ont été diagnostiqués au Burkina Faso avec 9 221 décès. Les cancers féminins viennent en tête avec 2 517 cas de cancer de col de l'utérus diagnostiqués, soit 21%, et 1436 cas de cancer de sein, soit 12,3%. Ces statistiques alarmantes, comme vous pouvez vous en douter, comme Monsieur le directeur général par intérim nous l'a si bien signalé, sont bien en deçà de la réalité car de nombreux décès liés au cancer surviennent en dehors des formations sanitaires, sans être comptabilisés nulle part. Ces données qui nous privent de tout sommeil, de toute quiétude, sont sensiblement les mêmes dans chacun des pays du Sud. Monsieur le directeur général par intérim, mesdames et messieurs, c'est ce qui justifie mon engagement dans la lutte contre le cancer depuis plus d'une dizaine d'années à travers la fondation Kimi, et ce, en appui à la volonté manifeste de l'État burkinabé de combattre farouchement ce fléau. Depuis 2016, un sursaut décisif est engagé pour créer les conditions optimales en vue de contenir les dégâts sociaux, économiques et psychologiques liés au cancer. Le Burkina Faso, mon pays, est résolument engagé afin d'arrêter l'expansion du nombre de personnes et de familles frappées par ce désastre qui porte un sérieux préjudice au développement durable de la nation en mobilisant les populations dans un combat contre les facteurs favorisant leur survenue. Mesdames et messieurs, les conditions de vie difficiles, l'analphabétisme, la croissance démographique insuffisamment contrôlée, la dégradation de l'environnement, le diagnostic tardif et le très faible accès aux moyens adéquats de prise en charge, à savoir la radiothérapie et la chimiothérapie, et dans la plupart des cas et d'une manière générale, le très faible accès aux services de santé sont des facteurs contributifs au développement des cancers. À titre illustratif, des données statistiques indiquent que plus de 70% des cas de cancer sont détectés à un stade très tardif, rendant leur prise en charge 
quasiment désespéré. C'est pourquoi, grâce à un plaidoyer de très haut niveau, ma fondation a obtenu de l'État burkinabé la construction d'un centre de radiothérapie dont les travaux ont été lancés en avril 2019 dans l'enceinte du centre hospitalier universitaire de Bogodogo, à Ouagadougou, la capitale. Pour l'exécution de cet important projet, le Burkina Faso bénéficie, à travers le secrétariat permanent à l'énergie atomique et à travers l'autorité nationale de radioprotection et de sûreté nucléaire, de l'assistance de l'AIEA pour le renforcement des capacités institutionnelles. Du reste, depuis 2010, dans le domaine du traitement du cancer, le Burkina a bénéficié de la part de l'AIEA de plusieurs cours régionaux de formation des personnels de santé, de visites scientifiques dans les systèmes d'autorisation et d'inspection des installations de radiothérapie et de médecine nucléaire, de bourses de stage sur les systèmes d'autorisation et d'inspection en radiothérapie et en médecine nucléaire, de cours nationaux animés par des experts de l'AIEA sur les procédures d'autorisation et d'inspection d'une installation de radiothérapie et de médecine nucléaire, sur la radioprotection dans le domaine médical et sur le contrôle qualité des équipements, Enfin, de dotation d'équipements de radioprotection et de contrôle qualité des appareils utilisés pour le traitement du cancer en radiothérapie et médecine nucléaire. Monsieur le directeur général par intérim, mesdames et messieurs, la collaboration avec l'AIEA a permis également, entre autres, la mise en place d'un service de médecine nucléaire fonctionnel au, centre du centre, au sein du centre hospitalier universitaire Yalgado, le principal hôpital de Ouagadougou. Cette collaboration a également permis la finalisation de l'évaluation des dossiers d'autorisation de construction des bunkers de radiothérapie et de médecine nucléaire au centre de cancérologie de Ouagadougou. La mise en œuvre du projet de construction et d'équipement du centre de radiothérapie de Bogodago qui se poursuit avec les procédures d'autorisation pour les importations des équipements émetteurs de rayonnement ionisant. En phase finale, avant le traitement des premiers patients, l'Autorité nationale de rapido de protection et de sûreté nucléaire procédera à une inspection approfondie des installations avant la délivrance de l'autorisation d'utiliser les dix équipements. Tout en me réjouissant de cette fructueuse contribution, je voudrais féliciter l'Agence internationale de l'énergie atomique et l'encourager à renforcer davantage son assistance au Burkina Faso à travers son programme de coopération technique afin qu'ensemble, nous puissions relever les dépits sanitaires du moment et à venir. Avant de clore mon propos, je voudrais, Monsieur le Directeur général par intérim, réaffirmer notre volonté de renforcer davantage notre coopération avec l'AIEA. Son importance pour l'atteinte des objectifs de développement durable dans mon pays n'est pas à démontrer. À vous, les partenaires bilatéraux et organisations de la société civile qui œuvraient à nos côtés dans la lutte contre ce fléau, je voudrais également vous témoigner notre reconnaissance dans vos efforts d'accompagnement. Notre victoire face à ce mal ne peut que se situer dans le cadre d'une coopération s'inscrivant dans la perspective d'une responsabilité commune et partagée. Merci pour votre attention. Merci à vous, Madame Caboret, Excellence. Ladies and gentlemen, we now welcome an esteemed speaker who is known in her country as the godmother of the fight against cancer. She is chairperson of the Foundation Tatali Iyali, a humanitarian organization that focuses on infectious diseases and on improving the living conditions of the Nigerian people. It is an honor to introduce the First Lady of Niger, Her Excellency, Madame Lala Malika Mahmadou. And she will also speak in French, so please, again, look for English translation on Channel 3.
Excellence, euh, Madame la Princesse euh, royale de Thaïlande, Excellence, Madame la Première Dame du Burkina Faso, Mesdames et Messieurs les ministres, Monsieur le Président de la Banque islamique du développement, Mesdames et Messieurs les directeurs généraux, Monsieur le directeur général de l'AIUA par intérim, Mesdames et Messieurs les experts, je me réjouis de l'initiative de ce forum scientifique sur le cancer, qui est un véritable problème de santé publique dans nos pays. À titre indicatif, selon l'Organisation mondiale de la santé OMS, les pays en voie de développement dans le Niger connaîtront une augmentation de 60% de la prévalence, soit 24 millions de nouveaux cas d'ici 2030, dont 72% de mortalité due au cancer. Le cancer révèle aussi plusieurs caractéristiques. Selon le registre national du cancer, les cinq premiers par ordre de fréquence sont ceux du foie, de la prostate, puis digestif, c'est-à-dire le côlon, l'estomac, l'ésophage, le lymphome, le myélome multiple, bouche et oropharynx chez l'homme. Chez la femme, viennent en tête le cancer du sein, de l'utérus, de l'ovaire, du côlon et du foie. Malgré le recrutement croissant du nombre de cas, il est unanimement admis que la prévalence du cancer est sous-estimée. Mesdames et Messieurs, la prévention et l'amélioration de la qualité des soins dans les formations sanitaires ont toujours fait partie des mesures phares des politiques nationales de santé publique de cette dernière décennie. C'est dans cette optique qu'un plan stratégique a été adopté par le gouvernement et une politique de création d'unités de dépistage des cancers du col, de l'utérus et du sein au niveau de tous les districts sanitaires du pays, qui est en cours de développement avec l'appui des partenaires. Dans le même cadre, des réseaux interministériels et parlementaires de lutte contre le tabac ont été mis en place. La Fondation Tatali, que je dirige, et d'autres ONG apportent un appui considérable à la lutte contre le cancer en termes de sensibilisation et de détection précoce, notamment chez les femmes et chez les enfants. Mesdames et Messieurs, le Centre national de radioprotection CNRP a été créé et rattaché au ministère de la Santé publique en 1998 pour la gestion des sources radioactives de faible activité conformément aux orientations de l'AUA. Cette structure a joué le rôle d'autorité de régulation et a assuré jusqu'en 2014 le suivi dosimétrique des travailleurs, du public et de l'ambiance, ainsi que le contrôle réglementaire. Avec l'engagement des plus autorités du Niger pour l'intensification des activités nucléaires dans tous les domaines clés du développement socio-économique, des dispositions ont été prises par le gouvernement pour la mise en norme internationale en vigueur des cadres réglementaires institutionnels et législatifs nationaux. Aujourd'hui, le Niger dispose, grâce à l'appui et l'encadrement de l'Agence, d'une loi nucléaire générale et d'une autorité de régulation et de sûreté nucléaire, ARSN. Mesdames et Messieurs, la coopération entre l'AUA et le Niger dans le domaine de la santé humaine a débuté il y a plusieurs dizaines d'années plusieurs vingtaines d'années, une vingtaine à peu près d'années. Elle a axé sur l'appui technique en médecine nucléaire et en radiothérapie, ainsi que la mise en relation avec les structures et les partenaires techniques et financiers tels que l'AFRA, le Pacte, le PEI, la BIT et la Principauté de Monaco. Cette collaboration a permis à mon pays de bénéficier de deux gamma caméras, de l'encadrement et de l'assistance nécessaire pour la construction des bunkers, d'une machine orthovoltage, de la dotation en iridium et du renforcement en capacité de ses ressources humaines. Un accélérateur linéaire, l'INAC, est en cours d'acquisition et le projet de construction d'un second centre à Zender a connu une bonne évolution. Mesdames et Messieurs, actuellement, les bunkers du Centre national de lutte contre le cancer CNLS sont prêts pour l'installation des équipements. Ce centre abrite une unité de chimiothérapie où sont pris en charge les cancers des adultes et pédiatriques. Dans ce secteur fonctionnel, le centre reçoit en moins 80 adultes et 20 enfants par jour. Le, le Niger dispose d'un labo laboratoire d'anatomie pathologique installé à la faculté des sciences de la santé FSS de l'Université Abdoumou de Niamey, où est actuellement logé le registre des cancers. La prise en charge des cancers est gratuite chez les femmes et les enfants de moins de 5 ans et c'est du dépistage au traitement. Quant au département de médecine nucléaire, il offre de nombreux examens à visée diagnostique, aussi bien in vivo que in vitro. 
Plus de 25 paramètres hormonaux et tumoraux sont dosés. Bientôt, la thérapie métabolique débutera avec le traitement isotopique des pathologies bénies de la thyroïde. C'est le lieu d'exprimer la profonde gratitude du Niger à l'AUA, à la Banque islamique de développement, aux États-Unis d'Amérique, à la principauté de Monaco et à tous les autres partenaires techniques et financiers pour leur précieuse contribution. Mesdames et Messieurs, le combat de la Fondation Tatali Yali contre le cancer, véritable problème de santé publique, pour lequel je me suis personnellement engagée en ma qualité de marraine nationale de lutte contre le fléau, repose essentiellement sur la sensibilisation, la prévention, le plaidoyer, la détection précoce et le traitement efficace. En juillet dernier, la Fondation a organisé en marche du sommet des chefs d'État et de gouvernement de l'Union africaine et en collaboration avec les ministres de la Santé, un forum des premières dames sur le, cancer, le fardeau du cancer, auquel plusieurs chefs d'État ont pris part. Mesdames et Messieurs, je fonde ainsi l'espoir qu'une vaste chaîne d'action verra le jour entre les États, les premières dames, les organisations internationales, les praticiens, le secteur privé, les ONG et fondations et tout autre bon volonté afin que le cancer cesse d'être un fardeau, en un mot, pour que le cancer soit vaincu. Mesdames et Messieurs, je vous remercie. Nous vous remercions, Excellence, Madame Mahmoudou. As we've been reminded, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, throughout the opening ceremony, fighting cancer is very costly indeed. Maximizing resources is crucial and experience shows that an effective, well thought out strategy can deliver very significant gains. We hear next from a country whose national cancer control plan, Esperanza, launched seven years ago, is often said to be a model for many other countries. She is Minister of Health of Peru, Her Excellency Madame Elizabeth Zulema Tomas Gonzalez, and she will speak in Spanish. Welcome. Director General Interino de la OIEA, Excelentísima Señora Princesa y Presidenta del Instituto de Investigación de Churlabón, Primera Dama de Burkina Faso y de Níger, señores viceministros de la Salud de la Federación Rusia, director del Instituto Nacional del Cáncer de los Estados Unidos, presidente del Grupo del Banco Islámico para el Desarrollo. Quisiera en primer lugar agradecer la invitación del Organismo Internacional de Energía Atómica para participar en este importante foro científico, una década de acción para el control del cáncer y camino a seguir. De igual manera, quisiera aprovechar esta oportunidad para reiterar a nombre del Gobierno del Perú mis más sentidas y profundas condolencias por el fallecimiento del embajador Yuki Yamano, a quien reconocemos por su extraordinario desempeño como director general y a quien recibimos en el Perú como un querido amigo en diferentes oportunidades. Agradecemos a él, dado que la vida y el rostro a átomos para la paz y el desarrollo en cientos de países. En ese contexto, Quiero exponer la historia y el significado que tiene la cooperación técnica internacional para el desarrollo y el reto que significa combatir el cáncer, desde la prevención y el tratamiento como problema de salud pública de mi país y de muchas regiones. Esta es una historia de esfuerzo y logro del uso pacífico de la energía atómica y el tratamiento con radiaciones que nuestros pacientes reciben. Hoy somos testigos de una transición epidemiológica que nos revela que el cáncer y las enfermedades crónico-degenerativas están ocupando el primer lugar en la mortalidad. Pero a la vez también vemos con optimismo 
y satisfacción como el Perú, con la ayuda del Organismo Internacional de Energía Atómica, se ha venido preparando para este reto en los próximos años. Actualmente, más de 70.000 pacientes diagnosticados con cáncer en mi país se atienden en un sistema de salud coberturado financieramente por el Estado, totalmente pagado por el Estado, de los cuales más del 60% requieren tratamiento con radiaciones durante este proceso. Ese optimismo se justifica por el desarrollo de proyectos de cooperación en los últimos 35 años, el cual continuará en el futuro, asistiendo a las instituciones peruanas y a sus profesionales en el ámbito de la radioterapia, radioterapia pediátrica, física médica, tecnología médica, protección radiológica, medicina nuclear, banco de tejidos, entre otros. En ese aspecto, más de 500 profesionales han sido capacitados en estos temas, lo que además nos ha permitido la adquisición de modernos equipos tecnológicos de la mano con adquisiciones técnicamente asesorados por este organismo. El resultado de esta cooperación es que los pacientes sin distinción de procedencia pueden acceder a la tecnología de última generación, segura y con calidad. Adicionalmente, hemos impulsado las acciones de promoción, prevención, tratamiento y cuidados paliativos, apoyados por la continuidad de los planes de lucha contra el cáncer que se ha venido ejecutando y que tiene el respaldo del gobierno mediante acciones concretas como las acciones del presupuesto fiscal, el cual ha ido progresivamente en incremento. Todo ello nos permite hablar de expectativas positivas y optimismo ante el reto que el cáncer nos pone, otorgándole a los pacientes una esperanza de vida y a toda la población la posibilidad de prevenir este tipo de afectación a la salud. Más de 35 años de cooperación con el Organismo Internacional de Energía Atómica ha permitido acciones coordinadas en ámbitos como los registros de cáncer poblacional de alta calidad, como el caso de Lima Metropolitana, donde se encuentra el más de 30% de la población peruana. A su vez, hemos realizado acciones de difusión, información y sensibilización a la población para que ésta pueda estar informada sobre estilos de vida, factores de riesgo y conducta saludable. Paralelamente, se ha promovido el desarrollo de tecnologías de radiaciones en calidad y seguridad, las cuales han tenido el aval directo del organismo y han permitido el rápido desarrollo de nuevas tecnologías costos efectivas, precisas y con profesionales técnicamente calificados. La capacitación y el proceso de ayuda mutua que caracterizan la dinámica de cooperación dentro del marco de salud global son una herramienta fundamental para afrontar el cáncer según los objetivos del desarrollo sostenible. En nuestro caso, esta cooperación ha sido bidireccional y el Perú ha contribuido a solicitud del OIEA en la capacitación de recursos humanos, tanto en la región como en otros continentes. El futuro sigue siendo promisorio, porque es decisión del Estado peruano tal como lo establece la Política General de Gobierno, que incluye entre sus lineamientos el desarrollo social y el bienestar de nuestra población. Ello se respalda en el presupuesto asignado y las acciones concretas con el objetivo de reforzar la lucha integral contra esta enfermedad, siendo el uso de las radiaciones un eje central y decisivo para su control. La misión del Programa de Acción para la terapia contra el cáncer, IMPACT 2014, permitió un diagnóstico exhaustivo de las necesidades del país y ha logrado promover las acciones necesarias para alcanzar el objetivo de reducir la mortalidad de las enfermedades crónicas degenerativas en un 30% al 2030. Compromiso que el Perú hace suyo, basándose en la continuidad de la cooperación tan necesaria y los frutos que ésta seguirá cosechando. 
quisiera resaltar el rol que cumple el OIEA con sus programas de cooperación a nivel regional que nos permite cumplir con los objetivos de la Agenda 2030, dirigidos especialmente para el, lograr el bienestar de la población. Asimismo, el Perú seguirá contribuyendo a las solicitudes de la comunidad internacional para aportar la experiencia y el conocimiento que a nivel reg regional pudiera ser necesarias, haciendo que los, los recursos alcanzados continúen proyectándose en el tiempo. Esta historia permite mirar las acciones de descentralización de la atención del cáncer desde una mejor posición para la siguiente década, convencidos que debemos acercar la oferta de salud a la población con calidad, con seguridad, con oportunidad y con humanización para poder cumplir los restos que esperan nuestros pacientes, sobre todo los más vulnerables. Finalmente, quiero agradecer al Organismo Internacional de Estados de Energía Atómica por su apoyo, por su colaboración, por su compromiso, por su cooperación, contribuyendo en la prevención y tratamiento del cáncer en nuestra región. Invoco a los países donantes a involucrarse cada vez más en la lucha contra este flagelo. Señoras y señores, la salud no espera. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Excellency, Madame Gonzalez. Ladies and gentlemen, we go next to Russia, where President Putin used last year's State of the Nation speech to announce a nationwide program to harness advanced science in a stepped-up fight against cancer. It is an honor to hand over to the Deputy Minister of Health of the Russian Federation, His Excellency Mr. Sergei Kraboy. Ваше Королевское Высочество, дамы и господа, уважаемые коллеги, от Министерства здравоохранения Российской Федерации и от себя лично хочу приветствовать участников научного форума и благодарю за предоставленную возможность принять в нем участие. Сегодняшний форум посвящен одной из наиболее актуальных проблем здравоохранения – онкологическим заболеваниям. МГТ – имеет более чем 50-летний опыт применения ядерных технологий в медицине, которые, наряду с хирургией и химиотерапией, являются одним из трех основных подходов к лечению рака. Следует с признательностью отметить основополагающую роль МГТ в создании платформы международного сотрудничества и помощи агентства государствам-членам в улучшении доступа к технологиям ядерной медицины и лучевой терапии, комплексному обеспечению не только развития ядерной медицины, но и соблюдения стандартов качества и безопасности при использовании ядерных и лучевых технологий. Пользуясь случаем, хочу выразить благодарность МАГАТЭ от лица Медицинского сообщества Российской Федерации за весомый вклад в развитие этой области. В соответствии с указом президента Российской Федерации от 7 мая 2018 года о национальных целях и стратегических задачах развития Российской Федерации до 2024 года борьба с онкологическими заболеваниями в Российской Федерации сегодня является одним из приоритетов в сфере здравоохранения. Значительное внимание уделяется переоснащению клиник современным медицинским оборудованием в том числе для лучевой диагностики или терапии. Так, уже сегодня российским пациентам доступен один из самых высокотехнологичных методов лечения – протонная терапия, в том числе в ультрасовременном центре протонной терапии Федерального медико-биологического агентства Министерства здравоохранения Российской Федерации. Важной составляющей, определяющей доступность для российских онкологических больных медицинской помощи с применением методов ядерной медицины и лучевой терапии является увеличение финансирования из федерального бюджета на оплату медицинских услуг, оказываемых с применением лучевой технологии. 
что позволит обеспечить решение главной задачи – широкую доступность этой высокотехнологичной медицинской помощи для населения. Программа действий по лечению рака является одной из наиболее востребованных неэнергетических программ технического сотрудничества МАГАТЭ. Она реализуется с 2004 года и направлена на повышение потенциала государств-членов МАГАТЭ в борьбе с онкологическими заболеваниями. Программа предусматривает сбор средств и реализацию в государственных членах соответствующих проектов. Российская Федерация в настоящее время осуществляет сотрудничество по программе в рамках соглашения между МАГАТЭ, Федеральным медико-биологическим агентством Министерства здравоохранения Российской Федерации и государственной корпорацией «Росатом». В рамках соглашения, действующего с 2016 по 2019 годы, в России проводятся профильные учебные курсы под эгидой МАГАТЭ для экспертов из России и других стран. В настоящее время ведется работа по рассмотрению продления этого соглашения на период до 2022 года, что позволит укрепить взаимодействие с МАГАТЭ и расширить сотрудничество в области программы действий по лечению рака. В заключение... Хочу пожелать форуму плодотворной работы. Уверен, что на форуме будут обсуждены важные темы, посвященные применению новых методов ядерной медицины и лучевой терапии в онкологии, поиску путей повышения эффективности взаимодействия в этой области. А результаты научных дискуссий на площадке форума обязательно найдут свое практическое воплощение в медицине и здравоохранении. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you very much, Excellency, Mr. Crevoy. We now welcome the acting head of one of the world's most venerable cancer research and training institutions, which is uh, currently funding a new moonshot portfolio as one of its leading initiatives, a cancer moonshot portfolio. Our next speaker is an award-winning expert on the human papilloma virus that causes cervical cancer and other malignancies. It is a great pleasure to hand over to the acting director of the U.S. National Cancer Institute and chief of its laboratory of cellular oncology, Mr. Douglas Lowy. Welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Princess uh, Chulaborn, uh, Excellencies, Director uh, General, ladies and gentlemen. It is a real honor for me to uh, be able to participate in this uh, section of this uh, important uh, conference. And I'd like to tell you very briefly about the National Cancer Institute, but then to focus on cervical cancer and the potential for controlling it and eventually eradicating it, not only in high-income countries, but also especially in low- and middle-income countries. The mission of the National Cancer Institute is to lead, conduct, and support cancer research across the nation to advance scientific knowledge and help all people live longer, healthier lives. NCI supports a wide range of cancer research from the most basic to the most applied. This morning, I am going to focus on the potential to control and eventually eliminate cervical cancer in low and middle income countries. There have been many research advances in recent years in the ability to prevent, to diagnose, and to treat cervical cancer. But these advances are currently applied unevenly. High-income countries of the world have the resources to take advantage of these advances, while low- and middle-income countries, whose resources are far more constrained, have thus far adopted them to a more limited degree the IAEA can play a critical role in overcoming this serious cancer health disparity because of the key role of radiotherapy in the treatment and cure of cervical cancer, as you heard from the inspiring film about Tanzania with the story of Margaret uh, and her cervical cancer. 
Early stage cervical cancer can have an excellent prognosis if treated appropriately. Radiotherapy is a key component of this treatment, as I will discuss in a few minutes. Before going further, let me provide some background and context to the problem of cervical cancer. It is estimated last year throughout the world there were about 570,000 cases of cervical cancer and 310,000 deaths. Close to 90% of these deaths occurred in low and middle income countries. Unless current approaches to cervical cancer changes, it is projected that the incidence and mortality will increase about 20% for every 10 years. And the vast majority of this increase will affect women in low and middle income countries. Despite these demoralizing statistics and projections, there are multiple interventions against cancer, uh, cervical cancer that can be highly effective. They include primary prevention by HPV vaccination, secondary prevention by cervical cancer screening and treatment of cervical precancer, treatment of invasive cervical cancer, and palliation of uh, advanced cancer. Up to now, none of these interventions have been widely implemented in low and middle income countries. But greater commitment to overcoming the problem of cervical cancer together with ongoing research could dramatically improve this situation. Let's consider each of these uh, interventions. It is now known that virtually all cases of cervical cancer are attributable to chronic infection by the human papillomavirus, or HPV. Population-wide approaches to the primary and secondary prevention of cervical cancer depend on this critical observation. They will have the greatest impact on reducing incidence and mortality in the long term. HPV vaccination can do this. However, the vaccine only prevents new infections, and it usually takes 20 to 30 years for the infection to result in cancer. This means that the impact of the vaccine on cancer will not be seen until many years after the beginning of a vaccination program. Although it is important to begin widespread vaccination in low and middle income countries now or in the future, the potential to save lives and improve quality of life in the shorter time frame will depend on cervical cancer screening, the treatment of invasive cancer, and palliation of advanced cancer. High quality cervical cancer screening can reduce incidence and mortality far more rapidly than vaccination because the interval between the detection of cervical precancer, which is the main goal of screening, and development of cervical cancer is far shorter than the interval following vaccination. Screen detected precancer can usually be treated effectively by local ablative therapy. Screen detected <clears throat> uh, in the United States, thanks to population-wide cervical cancer, the incidence of cervical cancer in the United States is about five times lower than what it was 70 years ago. By contrast, the high rates in low and middle income countries have not decreased because population-wide screening is relatively complicated and expensive to implement. The main barrier to widespread primary and secondary prevention is that current standard of care is not yet sufficiently cost effective. However, current research, if it is successful, has the potential to change standard of care and make both of these interventions substantially more cost effective. Several coordinated HPV vaccine trials are testing the hypothesis that a single HPV vaccine dose may be sufficient to induce strong protection. The decreased cost and the simplified logistics of a single dose could be transformative for vaccine deployment in low and middle income countries.
Cervical cancer screening research studies are testing the potential uh, for a scalable HPV detection technology that is far less expensive and could provide results more rapidly than current technology. There is also an artificial intelligence approach to a low-tech procedure, visualization of the cervix with acetic acid. The experimental uh, a, a, a algorithm for this artificial intelligence is called automated visual evaluation. It is simple enough that it can be stored in a smartphone which would first take a photo of uh, the cervix and then quickly analyze the photo to determine if the cervix has a lesion that should be treated. Many lesions that are detected by screening with precancers uh, will be treated locally but some of the screen women will turn out to have invasive cervical cancer, which requires more extensive treatment. In screened women, the invasive cervical cancer is more likely to be diagnosed in postmenopausal women than in premenopausal women. And the importance of screening both pre- and postmenopausal women provides a strong rationale for having sufficient infrastructure for the effective treatment of cancers detected by screening. In principle, early stage cancer is highly treatable, as you have heard in the story with Margaret. Many such cases can be cured. In the United States, for example, the five-year survival rate for women who present with stage one cervical cancer is about 90%. About two-thirds of women with stage two disease will live at least five years. And even stage three disease, one half. It's only women with stage four disease who have a poor prognosis. But compared with the United States, the outlook is currently much worse for women in low and middle income countries who present with cervical cancer. Depending on the country, between one half and two thirds of the women who develop cervical cancer will succumb to their tumor. By contrast, fewer than one third of women in the United States will die of their cancer. This enormous disparity is mainly attributable to two factors which in the not too distant future can be changed. First, women in the United States tend to be diagnosed with earlier stage cancer, thanks to widespread screening. Second, better treatment is available uh, for this. As the Deputy Minister of the Russian Federation noted, there are three main modalities for the treatment of early stage disease, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. The precise combination of these interventions will depend on the stage of disease and their availability. The best results are usually seen when all three approaches are combined. Investment that enables greater access to these approaches can improve the outlook uh, for women with cervical cancer. For those women who can't be cured, palliation of advanced disease also becomes very important, does not need to be expensive, and can have a major impact on the quality of life, as you heard from the Minister of Peru. However, most low and middle income countries do not offer pain management, such as opioid treatment. The benefits of increasing the availability of this modality can extend far beyond cervical cancer to virtually all serious chronic disease where pain is a prominent manifestation. In addition, strengthening the infrastructure for surgery, for radiotherapy, and chemotherapy and palliation can have a positive impact on the treatment of many other diseases. In closing, I hope it is clear from what I have said that there are enormous opportunities to reduce the burden of cervical cancer in low and middle income countries. To do so will require more research, greater commitment, and increased investment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Acting Director, Mr. Louis, also for those clear words on cervical cancer, a topic to which we will return in later sessions of the Scientific Forum. 
Let's come back now to the very important subject of collaboration, and we hear next from a key IAEA, IAEA partner in the effort to boost action on cancer control. Fifteen years ago, the World Health Organization, the WHO, initiated a groundbreaking series of best practice cancer control models, modules with a special focus on low- and middle-income countries. The Director General, Mr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, could unfortunately not be with us here live today, but he did send us this video message. Honorable Ministers, distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends, First, I would like to honor the life service and legacy of my late brother, Yukia Amano. He was a great man, leader and partner for health and sustainable development. We must build on his legacy by continuing the long and successful collaboration between WHO and IAEA on cancer. Your support has helped to ensure more people can access radiotherapy and nuclear medicine. But we still have a long way to go. There is still far too much avoidable suffering from cancer. To accelerate action, WHO is pleased to be working with IAEA and other partners on two global initiatives in cancer. The first is to eliminate cervical cancer as a public health concern. No woman should suffer or die from cervical cancer when we can prevent and treat it. Second, we must act against childhood cancer. Whether a child with cancer lives or dies should not depend on where the child is born. For both cervical cancer and childhood cancers, survival in high-income countries is at least 70%, while it's generally less than 30% in Africa. The next decade will be critical in our fight against cancer. We have the evidence and the tools to save millions of lives. We have no excuse if we do not act. We look forward to our continued collaboration with IAEA for a healthier, safer, fairer world. I thank you. And now to round off this opening ceremony, let us hear from a very important financial partner. In 2012, the IAEA joined up with the Organization of Islamic Cooperation and the Islamic Development Bank to mobilize financial and human resources for promoting effective cancer control. That coordination is ongoing, as we hear now from Mr. Bandar M. H. Hajar. He is president of the Islamic Development Bank Group. Please welcome him. Your Highness, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is a great honor for me to address this August Scientific Forum. It gives me even greater pleasure to speak to you on the partnership between Islamic Development Bank and the International Atomic Energy Agency. Today, this long-standing partnership between the Islamic Development Bank and the International Atomic Energy Agency will enter a new phase. This afternoon, we will jointly sign a new partnership initiative for the breast and cervical cancer control in developing countries. Saving women's life from cancer is a commendable endeavor to which I am wholeheartedly committed. Non-communicable diseases are too often viewed as a first world problem, but the reality is that they are often much more pronounced in low and middle east and middle income countries. According to the International Agency for Research on Cancer, 
More than 8.6 million women worldwide suffer from largely preventable and treatable cancer. In 2018, alone, over 2 million women were diagnosed with breast cancer and over 600,000 related deaths occurred. In addition, 570,000 women were diagnosed with cervical cancer and more than 300,000 women are subject to that disease. Low and middle income countries, which make up the majority of our member countries, are among those that suffer the most. Almost half of the women with breast cancer in the 17 of the ICTP IAEA member countries are projected to die from that disease. This is compared to less than a fourth, 22% of affected women in high income countries. The late Director General of the IEA, Yukai Amano, once made the following points. Breast cancer is the top cancer in women worldwide. And it is, and it is number are increasing everywhere. But the women in, the, in North America, Sweden, and, or Japan has an over 80% chance of surviving, whereas in Africa, a woman is more than twice as likely to die from that disease. The difference is due to the huge discrepancy in the availability of prevention, screening, early diagnosis, diagnosis and treatment services. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, health is integrated in the ICTB group vision with a focus on priority areas such as health system strength, strengthening, disease prevention and control, and alternative health financing. Since its inception, the ICDB group has approved $4.6 billion in financing for the health sector. A number of flagship programs on priority health issues have been successfully implemented including fight against avoidable blindness, polio reduction, Fistola vaccine, malaria, HIV, AIDS, NCB, NCD, and maternal, newborn and children. Health, since 2013, the ISTB has approved $364 million in grant and loans for cancer control program in member countries, including Senegal, Uzbekistan, Niger, Guinea, Iran, Suriname, and Djibouti. One of the bank's, one of the bank's success stories in health sector was, it is a $427 million contribution to, to polio reduction efforts in Pakistan in collaboration with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It has helped in bridging the critical financing gap for polio education in Pakistan since 2013. Though this program over 38 million children received polio vaccination across Pakistan through the support of 260,000 polio frontline workers. The ISTB has joined hand with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to establish Life and Livelihoods Fund in partnership with Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and United Arab Emirates, and other donors. Launched in September 2016, the LLF Fund helped lift millions of people out of poverty and save millions of lives through a mixed a multi-donor grant and the ISTB lending capital held in a trust fund administered by the Islamic Development Bank. Low and, low, low and lower middle income countries can borrow funds on consensual terms to finance agriculture, 
health and infrastructure project. Over the five years, 2016 to 2020 period, the fund will make $2 billion available for the project to help the poorest people in the ISTP member countries uh, lead healthier and more productive lives. The ISTP also support to malaria, malaria prevention and control. In several member countries is another success story. The ISTP support to the seasonal malaria program in Cameroon, for example, has contributed to the reduction of malaria and mortality in selected area of the country. Following the outbreak of Ebola versus uh, disease, the ISTB, in coordination with the Organization of Islamic Conference, organized fundraising conference in November 2014 with $10 million seed money. The bank mobilized a total of $51 million in support to effort to control EV, EVD in four West African countries, namely Mali, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia. Late Saudi King Abdullah bin Abdulaziz donated $35 million in favor, in favor of Guinea, $12 million, Liberia, $6 million, Mali, $2.5 million, and Sierra Leone, $6 million, and $7.5 million in support of widows and orphans. Such donation is being administered by the Islamic Development Bank as the sole trust sole trustee under the Fa'al Khair program. Provision of 75 solar power also, mobile medical clinic in seven member countries, Yemen, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan over a five years period, 2015-2022 is another initiative under the Fa'al Khair program. The STB also take pride of its flagship alliance to fight avoidable blindness. Launched in 2018, the first generation of this regional partnership covered eight African member countries, providing eye care services to 244,000 people, and it managed to restore the site of more than 49,000 Beneficiaries. Building on this success of the first generation, the Islamic Development Bank Group, along with 32 partners, have agreed to continue the fight by launching the second generation of Alliance 2018 and 2022, covering 13 African member countries Burkina Faso, Chad, Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire, Djibouti. Guinea-Bissau, Mauritania, Mali, Mozambique, uh, Niger, Togo, and Somalia. The objective was to raise just 25 million to perform 100,000 cataract surgeries and examine 1 million children. The campaign managed to raise $250 million, including in funding for 1.5 million cataract surgeries in favor of 10 million children in ISTB member countries. Under the ISTB, a new business model, which, which rests on expanding partnership and exploring new and innovative financing tools, capitalizing on science, technology, and innovation, STI in social and economic development, the ISTP Board of Executive Director has approved the creation of four funds. First, Transform Fund with $500 million that provide seed money for startup and SMEs to develop the ideas and facilities the commercialized technology. The second fund is cholera and other diarrhea disease Reduction Fund, and this is a cooperation between the ISTB and the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Society to establish 
a multi-donor trust fund administrated by the bank, its objective is to mobilize a new type of philanthropic and impact investing cap capital and implement grant-based cholera and other diarrhea disease control and prevention program in 29 ISTP member countries affecting the life of 5 million people. The fund which will issue wash impact Sukuk is expected to mobilize 150 million by 2021. Global Muslim Philanthropy Fund for Children, a joint initiative between the ISTB and UNICEF as a multi-donor trust fund to be administered by the Islamic Development Bank, it aims to mobilize to mobilize uh, for the, this program to ensure the well-being of children in the ISTB member countries. It will provide an additional pool for consensual financing to ISTB member countries. The fund will have an initial capital of $250 million to be mobilized over the three years period from 2020 to 2022. Sabil Fund is a multi-donor trust fund established in partnership with the Global Fund. It aims to improve the social development outcome of refugee and internally displaced person. The program funded by the Sabil Fund will initially focus in the first year on the health-based intervention in line with the, with the Global Fund mandate of the HIV. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to say that a decade-long cooperation between the ISTB and OIC and the IAEA in improving cancer control in joint member countries was in process into, into it started in 2016, signing of the of a of a practical arrangement to facilitate technical support and resource mobilization in a comprehensive cancer control prevention, early detection, diagnosis, and treatment. In June 2018, the ISTB, the Asian Development Bank, and the IAEA organized high-level seminar on cooperation in support of Asian countries' efforts to tackle cancer in Philippines. In July 2018, ISTB and IAEA supported a cancer awareness meeting in Burkina Faso, organized by OIC and hosted by African First Lady. And this collaboration has led to the realization that there was an urgent need to further expand the ISTB, OIC, and IAEA. Uh, EA, partnership to effectively tackle the issue of cancer among women. Ladies and gentlemen, the IAEA developed funding proposal on improving diagnosis and treatment of women's cancer in low and middle income countries is another response for breast and cervical cancer related technical assistance an investment project in 17 joint member countries. The joint member countries invited to participate in the first phase of our partnership initiative are Albania, Azerbaijan, Bangladesh, Benin, Burkina Faso, Djibouti, Iraq, Ivory Coast, Kyrgyzstan, Libya, Malaysia, Morocco, Niger, Sierra Leone, Senegal, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. Though this initiative, we will have ambitious goal to achieve, namely to col collaborate, contribute to the global effort to save millions of women's lives from breast and cervical cancer, raise awareness about the importance of cancer care worldwide, particularly developing countries, improve gender equality and basic right and basic human rights, including the right of health over platform to bring together partners in a joint effort to fight cancer and enable 
a broad part particip participation and contribution from government, multilateral bank, philanthropic foundation, and the private sector. I truly look, up, look forward to launching ceremony of the Joint Partnership Initiative to fight women cancer today, and the ISTB will work together with the IAEA and partners toward mobilizing an initial $10 million of grant funding, which will unlock 30 million in consensual ordinary resources to benefit patients in our member countries. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by saying that by joining force, by joining forces, ISTB and IAEA will provide, a, will provide a concrete platform delivering tangible results to comprehensive, co comprehensively address cancer prevention, screening, diagnostic, and treatment services for women in joint member countries, and thus contributing to saving over 1 million women lives from breast cancer and 3.7 million women's lives from cervical cancer over the next decade. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings our opening ceremony to a close. We are very, very grateful to all of our esteemed speakers, Professor, Dr. Her Royal Highness, Excellencies. Thank you very much for being with us. We will take your messages with us into the remainder of the forum. We go now to a coffee break, ladies and gentlemen. It's a short one.